Dork Souls. <clears throat> Dark Souls. Have you ever felt like this game was overrated? I don't want to say Dark Souls is overrated just yet. I'm just saying there are dozens of videos called Dark Souls is a Masterpiece and why is Dark Souls so good? I want to give you an honest review on this game with no exaggerations. I'm not taking my take as objective and free of any bias, no, but I've beaten Dark Souls 1 after beating Dark Souls 3, so I may have a very different perspective than some of you. Whether you're someone who's never played a Souls game before, or you're a Souls veteran wanting to revisit the game, I think this review has something valuable for everyone. This is my no-nonsense, no roast into glasses take on Dark Souls. For the uninitiated, Dark Souls 1 is a game that throws you in a cell, doesn't even pat you on the back or tell you good luck. Within possibly two minutes of exploring and fighting some minor enemies, you'll find this guy. Not very friendly, per se. No controls are explained, but they are easy to figure out if you've played a third-person RPG before. Part of the way this game's controls are laid out can get really frustrating, though more about that later. Movement feels good, attacks feel like they have proper weight and impact to them, both from the enemies and the player. The dodge roll is very satisfying, and no wonder it's pretty much a staple of this entire genre of games. You feel like a badass dodging a big hit with that roll. Just got logged out of RuneScape, sorry. <clears throat> What's also a staple of this genre is that the story is basically non-existent. It's very, very basic, but a fleshed out intricate story wouldn't have fit this game anyways. You learn much about the world through lore and speculation, environmental storytelling, and going to talk to very obscure NPCs rather than being told all of the story beforehand. The plot of this game can be boiled down to the following. My final message. Goodbye. But the lore and character design of this game, on the other hand, are astonishingly good. Insanely good for being this well done, but simultaneously being able to be dumbed down to Dragon, Demon, Dragon, Demon, Dragon, Demon, Knight, McDonald's Knight, Fallen Knight, Giant Enemy Spider, Golem, Flying Golem, Crazy Bitches, and a Dog. Oh, and a boss called Ceaseless Discharge. Non-stop coming. Never-ending orgasm. Anyway, the game introduces you to a wide variety of playstyles, from slow, sluggish, but tanky, to fast and nimble, but fragile, when we're talking about armor, and basically the same for the weapons. However, there are some exceptions to this. One weapon and one armor set that are so broken that you will get flack for and be called a noob for using it. Tell me which weapon and which armor you think it is in the comments. I'll tell you later. Defeating enemies gives you souls. Those souls can be exchanged for level ups, and the amount of souls for each level up increases exponentially, but so do the rewards for killing enemies, as you find tougher and tougher opponents. Each level up requires you to choose a stat to increase, which all have a major and minor effect. This is one of the pillars of Souls games. For example, upgrading the Endurance stat is mainly stamina, but later also gives max equip load and resistance to bleeding. Intuitive? No. Cool? Yeah, maybe. You could also use those souls to upgrade your weapon into the blacksmith using Titanite shards. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, you drop all your souls on death and have a singular chance to get them back. If you die again, they go and join your socks inside the washing machine black hole. It's kind of the whole point and charm of the game to lose souls so easily, so it's funny I would forget to mention it at all, actually. The gameplay loop may sound boring to some of you, but trust me, it's not. In short, you go explore area, light bonfires, find boss, kill boss, find next area, rinse and repeat. Reason why it's not boring is that each area is unique, has a certain vibe, and mostly introduces new types of enemies and challenges. You then overcome those challenges and are met with a new area that introduces new ones. There's always an anticipation of, oh, what's next? I want to see this. And that's a great way to make it an interesting game. This game feels like a linear maze in comparison to Dark Souls 3. There's mostly only one way out, but you have to figure out when to backtrack to progress. And at some points, it feels like this game should be called Met Dark Souls Troid. However, with a little patience, you too can figure out where to go and make your way all the way to the end. You need to earn the bonfire warp, and there are some cut-off bonfires that won't let you warp out until you progress a little further to go back. In Dark Souls 3, you would have had the warp from the beginning, and in fact, you need to warp to the first separate area from Firelink Shrine, and that's way, way more unintuitive than just finding the first area by walking to it. Dark Souls 1 wins this one, I'm afraid. Generally, a flow of challenge to reward ratio is really good. It's basically what this game is known for. Very hard, very frustrating. No! Ah, no! But that makes it all that much more satisfying to finally beat a boss after fighting it for a very, very long time, having learned all of its attack patterns and timings along the way. I'm a big boy, all right? I got this. I believe in myself. And then you can flip the table over and yell into a pillow. Maybe for content, but like not really. I like my table and I like my pillow. I got this. Blood, I got this. No, 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 no. Ah! Oh, I, I really thought I would I would have choked there. 
I would have choked my own dick. The boss designs themselves are varied and they almost always nail the aesthetic of the place they're found in and the attack animations are unique, cool, interesting, and most importantly, give a clear indication of when an attack is about to happen. Because if there's one thing souls like players hate, is no tell on an enemy attack. There are also what I'd call mini bosses, the red eyed enemies like boars that are much more dangerous, give more souls, and don't ever respawn once killed. Pretty neat, actually. The atmosphere of some areas is truly breathtaking, even though this is a Skyrim year game. Well, that's beautiful. And quite frankly, the view distance is awful. Nevertheless, they managed to convey much by showing you relatively little at a time compared to an open world game. Oh, yeah, this game is linear. It's not played in a straight line at all, but 99% of the time, there's really only one thing you can be doing to progress. This is both good and bad, I'll talk more about that in the bad section. The good side of this is that you're constantly changing circling back to areas in a new way with either a shortcut, a new item, or something else, and it can help make the world feel refreshing. Dark Souls 1 feels like it has less of the farm souls going on compared to Dark Souls 3, where I remember spending hours grinding away at big skelly monsters for half a million souls. Playing Dark Souls 1, I never needed to get that high. By the time I finished the game, one level up cost the exact amount you see on screen. Granted, Dark Souls 3 is about double the playtime for a first playthrough. For me, that one was 110 hours. Dark Souls introduces many characters who went on to become some of the most recognizable characters of the Souls games. Among these are Patches, the bald dickhead who always offers to help and then betrays you. Good day. Are you a cleric or something? Uh, I guess I am. I guessed as much. There's a stash of treasure right down that hole. Mm. I owe you for all that, uh, praying or whatnot. Have a look. <laughs> I see. I know something very Dark Souls is about. And Solaire, who's the origin of Praise the Sun, and is also a pretty funny lad if you happen to do his obscure questline. I suppose they wouldn't be far off. <laughs> There's also John Dark Souls. The main story, on the other hand, is forgettable because there isn't much to remember. We are the chosen one, need to bring two bells, kill a couple guys, light a fire, and kill Gwyn. Why are we doing this? I for gore, to be honest. I for gore. The developers have balls. Big fucking steely balls for making a game so obviously frustrating, and I like it. I know Dark Souls isn't the first of its kind, there's Demon Souls before it and Kingsfield before everything, but Dark Souls was a big success, even with all the obvious against the stream design decisions from the developers here. It takes big balls to invest this much collective effort into a product and be like, oh we know realistically a huge chunk of our potential audience is going to be alienated by the kick in the balls that is this game, but the ones that do like it I gotta love it. This game, for the most part, was the inspiration for not just a trilogy with some spiritual successors. No, it was the inspiration for an entire genre of games. There's absolutely no denying that this game has a huge name and was a big inspiration for many upcoming game devs and teams and undoubtedly spawned many more great games in the dozen plus years after its release. There was an obvious ambition to innovate, to put stuff into a game that was on a top five things not to do list for other games before it. And I'm glad they chose this philosophy because without Dark Souls, this Souls-like genre would probably be this incredibly tiny little niche thing that you have to be an ultra turbo nerd to know about. We'll come back to this avant-garde philosophy later because it's a double-edged sword and it, it also cuts this game pretty badly. Speaking of the bad, there is a big difference between a hard game and a frustrating game. Dark Souls' whole polemic identity is built on being a hard and frustrating game that isn't afraid to piss you in the mouth and then kiss you goodnight in the same fucking minute. Look at Lost Isolate, an area full of these big, almost unavoidable demons that will kill you in two hits, bonfires behind hidden walls, the floor is lava, and there's an incredibly gimmicky, almost pointless boss fight called Bed of Chaos that basically requires you to die to progress it. Oh, and good luck running through Lost Isolate again if you do die. I did just this for about two hours. A run back to that boss, even if executed perfectly and having taken no damage, is an awful waste of time for such a disappointment of a boss. Oh, and have a look at this thrilling, almost 20 second mandatory slide before the boss arena. Yeah, I mean, it's just so stupid. Then compare Bed of Chaos to Pinwheel, a boss ironically and affectionately called the hardest boss of the game. Here's the entirety of the boss fight. Hello. Uh, why is there multiple of you? Well, there's not anymore. Spooky, in it. Oh, he's got like no health. Well, that was lame. Weakness anywhere. 
but at some points this game definitely crosses a line of frustration for me. I'm convinced many people start huffing copium and saying, but it's supposed to be hard, you don't get the point, you're supposed to die, and if you criticize the game you're a coward and a loser. And then of course there's a journalist saying, this game is way too hard, how can anybody play this, this is so hard, but my teeny tiny baby hands I have to look down at the controller, where is L3? But frankly for me all good games come somewhere in the middle ground, challenging, but rewarding and fun. Dark Souls is spicy. Not the kind of spicy that just enhances the food and makes it taste better. No, Dark Souls is the kind of spicy that makes you think, shit, maybe the whole Tabasco bottle is a little more than I can handle. And you can finish the meal, but you definitely cried a little along the way, and it didn't need to be that hot. You'll still deny later that you cried eating that kebab. We've seen how bad it is to have to run all the way back to Bed of Chaos just to have the chance to try its boss fight. Another terrible run back boss combo is Capra Demon, whom you fight in a terribly narrow space with ads for no reason, and Sheath. A boss fight that requires you to run a very long way on literally invisible paths and then dodge the Ultra Doom Clams of Death. Oh, and that boss can permanently reduce your max health. Good luck finding out how to gain it back because the game doesn't tell you how. Most systems are broadly the same as in Dark Souls 3, and that's a good thing. Except you don't get shown what the equipment load is at which you fat roll, it's 25%, and you don't get shown how many souls you need to level up. How much does it require to level up? That's how many I have. That's not how many it takes. For that, you need to be in the level up screen. In Dark Souls 3, you can just open the menu and look at the stat. Pyromancy and Magic are almost the same since they feel the same, but there's no FP or mana, in other words. You just have a number of charges that recharge when resting, which is okay to me. Covenants are just as obscure, parrying and backstabbing are about the same, still really, really good and satisfying and a sign of a skilled player. It feels like you can get way less max health and stamina, and personally, I think they made a good choice by allowing you to get more of that in DS3. DS1 just feels messy when you have 20 S flasks and are expected to use them all. On the subject of feeling messy, you could use a teeny tiny amount of souls to repair your weapon. Yes, you heard me right, there's durability in this game. I sincerely think this has absolutely no place in this game since it costs pennies to always repair your stuff and once you buy the repair boxes, you can do that at any bonfire. However, if you forget to do that, you risk doing very little damage with your currently equipped weapon or taking way more damage with your currently equipped armor. So very little cost, very little consequences, it's just a matter of remembering your chore to go back and repair. This mechanic has led to me not knowing that repair boxes existed yet when I was trapped in the sewers fighting the gaping dragon with a broken plus five Zweihander and looking back this fight would have been so, so much easier if I had remembered to do my repairing or if this fucking mechanic didn't exist in this game. Have you ever had difficulties finding the expansion of a game? Normally it's this hugely advertised thing. When you start up the game, some games will ask you, do you want to play the DLC right away? But not this game. No, this game makes you jump through very, very specific hoops to even get access. <clears throat> First, you need to kill the giant Hydra and save an NPC from death. Fair enough. Obvious enough. Big and strong enemy. Then, you need to obtain the Lord Vessel and give it to one of two NPCs. Okay, nice. Are we done? No. You need to go to the Duke's archives and at the specific bonfire, run forward and kill the specific crystal golem and you obtain a broken pendant if you've done steps one and two. Now, can we use the item to end the expansion? No, child. Go back to where you killed the Hydra. No, not where it died. More left. Even more left. Uh, yes. Take the portal. That's standing right there and you'll be transported to Sanctuary Garden and fight the Sanctuary Guardian, which I first tried, by the way. Ooh. Ah! Wait, I actually first tried this. Nice. This boss I found pretty enjoyable to fight, actually, and I enjoyed the rest of the expansion, but I would never in a million years have found all this content if it wasn't for my Twitch chat. Same for the painted world of Ariamis. How the fuck was I supposed to find that? Who boots up Dark Souls and starts playing Mario 64? Yes, you actually need to walk up to a giant painting and, well, hop on into it. Let's go! What a stock ass horror movie sound effect. Wow, that was a very abrupt cutscene. I do just Super Mario into the fucking painting. Hence the name, Painted World. I only see can't speak much about invasions. I wasn't human for very long at a time, so I only got invaded twice, and it was usually over for me in about two to 10 seconds. Oh, what? Where did you come from? The hell?
I guess I don't stay human then, if that's what's gonna happen. I don't like the invasion mechanic in the Soul series, or rather, I don't care for it. It's just a thing of, oh well, another no lifer has killed me. Shameth be thee. But I don't think about it more than that. That's hugely due to me not being a big fan of PvP and RPGs because you can just gear check and stat check people, and also because Dark Souls netcode is notoriously bad and a hassle to deal with. For those of you who don't know, being human in Dark Souls 1 or embered in Dark Souls 3 means another player can invade you. I don't know if this is supposed to be a trade-off of being human or embered or a payoff for being bored in the endgame, but this is just 1v1 PvP. You can also 1v2 or 1v3. Or 2v2 and 2v- I don't even know, man. Either way, not my thing, I can't opine much on this, feels the same to me in both games. One thing that has perplexed me a lot was Dark Souls 1's fog gates. Fog gates are a staple mechanic. But in games like Dark Souls 3, they always, always indicate a boss fight. They always go away only when the boss is beaten and aren't there sometimes for the first time when the fight is triggered. In Dark Souls 1, they can literally be anywhere. There will be random fog gates that you just walk through once just to find a bunch of normal tier enemies, and you can sometimes just promptly walk back the way you came and forget about the fog gate since it doesn't respawn. Actually, you might think this would annoy me, but personally, I like the fog gate being ominous and indicative of a boss fight, but it doesn't guarantee one. Meaning all bosses have fog gates, but not all fog gates are bosses. It adds a little intrigue and mystery and breaks up the loop once in a while. On another note, if you guessed Zweihänder and Havel's armor when I asked what the notorious noob strats were before, then congratulations, you've either played this game enough to know what's up, or like me, streamed using these items and gotten flack for it. I, I don't get it. I mean, yes, they are very strong, but that's kind of the point. Dark Souls is a game that rewards knowledge. Maybe a little too much, I'll expand on that. If you happen to know where the Zweihänder is found and spec into strength early on, you're rewarded for it. I don't really see the problem in specifically this weapon. It's a slow and clunky weapon and god forbid you try to one-hand it. Havel's armor on the other hand changes the way you play completely. It is a heavy armor. Not just by the looks or names, it's a very very heavy armor to the point where you might need Havel's special ring to wear it at all. Also, being at this high of an equip load means that you'll fat roll, which is something I personally despise since it makes dodges nigh unusable and this game just turns into a button masher. So, I think this armor is a set with very clear pros and cons that you can't just call Cheating. That being said, I did smash the shit out of Four Kings with the full Havel set and the Zweihänder. I also remember the Butcher's Cleaver from Dark Souls 3, and if the Zweihänder in this game is unfair, then oh boy, the Butcher's Cleaver is just plain cheating. That weapon wasn't even slow, it was just godly. Insane strength scaling, insane one-handing, good jumping attacks reached the whole lot. I mentioned Estus Flasks before, and in case you don't know, they're this game's healing potions. Normally you'd find a key item and upgrade its healing power, and another key item to upgrade the maximum capacity that resting in a bonfire would refill, but Dark Souls handles it weirdly. There are key items to upgrade the Estus Flasks power, and they're called Firekeeper Souls, but in 50 five hours of my first playthrough, I found three. And I used one of them to actually revive a firekeeper who are the ones who can upgrade the flask in the first place. They're supposed to be 10 or more, so they must be extremely well hidden or at the end of a quest line that I somehow missed or fucked up. And I was pretty thorough with my exploration of places throughout the whole game, except for Blight Town. Fuck that place and fuck its designer. That's not a... Oh, God damn it. Stop <laughs> the fucking laugh track, really? TLDR, Firekeeper Souls are very hard to find if you're not jerking off to a wiki. Some enemies can use Estus Flasks too, by the way. Sick, eh? Actually, upgrading the capacity of Estus is also weird. Although I never really bothered until the part where you fight seven fucking Capra Demons in a row. Doesn't this just reinforce that Capra Demon should never have been its own boss fight? Because if it was a proper boss, it wouldn't be walking around so widely like this later in the fucking game. And if it wasn't a boss enemy, then why make it a boss enemy? Capra Demon, more like Capra Dees. Since until coming here, there isn't much point to put the extra effort into kindling bonfires with the humanity you acquire along the way. What do you do with it? I mentioned that I wasn't human for a very long time. Rather, I was hollow almost the entire game. This game's hollowness is different from Dark Souls 3's hollowness in that you don't acquire it by choice to attain more power, but you acquire it when you die, and the only way to become human again is to use humanity to become human at a bonfire. It's kind of pointless to constantly run around as a human unless you're too good at the game to die, in which case, do what you want and hats off to you. Everything about my experience with this game would have been way, way worse if I wasn't on stream and had people helping me out of some very big pits the game has. For example, getting cursed by the smooth skin dragon isn't a big deal when you know that you can just go back and buy a stone to fix all your problems. However, if you don't know how to get uncursed, congratulations, you're now considerably more fucked for the rest of the game. If you're not live streaming this to people who've played the game before, just prepare a link to a wiki. I'm not the biggest fan of this, but this game is also 13 years old, so some of the design decisions are practically outdated. Speaking of the design philosophy, the whole game relies on knowledge 
and is very linear. The first time run took me 55 hours, while live with chat's occasional help, mostly did it by myself though and I didn't wiki, but it might take about 9 hours or even less to run when knowing what to do without exactly speedrunning it. So 4 fifths of your time are used up by figuring out what to do, where to go, who to talk to, and that can be fun, but it can also be extremely frustrating. No direction in sight's exploration, but sometimes you can get punished for exploring to the wrong place. And Dark Souls never gives you a break and never lets you explore in peace. Here's where the sword shows that it's doubly edged. It really feels like some of the stuff they were trying to do in breaking the rules of gaming at the time just went too far into the wrong direction. I mean, the Miyazaki Swamp. There's so many things that are just an obvious big fuck you to the face, and not in the fun challenging way where you overcome something the game throws at you, but in the unfun stupid kind of way where you're sitting there alone at 20 years old in your room by yourself and just think, what the fuck am I doing with my life? If you think that the game has been fixed in the remastered version, then I'm sorry to tell you, but that, it, it, you're wrong. Still some bugs, still performance issues, and all the rest. It just looks a little neater, and well, you can't even buy the original anymore. In short, it's just same old, same old, but with less actually compatible mods nothing we can really do about it. I know for a fact big issues weren't fixed in the remastered version because I ran into a bug that when you had a controller connected and also a keyboard and mouse, which I'd expect to be 90% of people playing this game on Steam, and then decided to press Alt-Tab to switch application focus, the game would freak out. If you then Alt-Tab back in, the game would spam light attack for whatever reason, even if neither the left click nor R1 was pressed in that time frame. What? No! No, 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 no! No, 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 I tapped into the game! No, 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 that's not what I wanted to do! Please tell me he de-aggros. Solaire, I was kidding. I was kidding. No, Solaire! Solaire! Solaire, I was kidding, okay? This led to me hitting Solaire in the noggin twice and needing to get absolved by the dude back in the first bell tower for a total of 50k souls, which wasn't terribly much, but between gathering that and the backtracking, I probably lost an hour or so of gameplay to this bug. You gotta be fucking kidding me. I just wanted to tab the fuck out. No. Ah, dude, I tabbed out and I wanted to increase the volume. Now I need another 25,000 souls. See what I mean? I am not doing anything. I move. I move. That's all I'm doing. What the fuck? Incredibly unnerving bug, and I bet you it's fairly easy to fix, but they just couldn't be bothered. There are definitely telltale signs that this is indeed an early 2010s game. The hitboxes are quite janky, especially in motion and when paired with fluid animations. What is the hitbox? God damn, that is a stupid hitbox. Enemies will still have a hitbox when killed and remain body blocking you before ragdolling for about a second or two. This has killed me many, many times in narrow places. The hitboxes may be rough, but the ragdolls in this game are pretty funny. It's like the whole early 2010s realistic physics simulation thing, and I'm all for it since basically it turns the game into GOAT simulator for a couple seconds, and you can have a laugh to distract you from the fact that you're in Blacktown. Did you remember that I said that there were things about the controls of this game that are pretty frustrating? Let me tell you. B is run, jump, and roll. On paper, that seems like it could work, but in practice, you're gonna end up jumping a lot when you didn't mean to. This is easily solved by moving jump to another button in later games. Now you can cancel your run with a roll. Yay, innovation. The input queuing window of this game is way too big to be useful. No, quite the contrary, it's jarringly annoying. You'll be hitting the attack button twice, or the roll button, and your character will do more than you had intended it to do. This isn't the worst since you can just get used to it and be more mindful of your inputs, but it doesn't feel great either. There is another thing about how you control your character that is very annoying to deal with and very unintuitive. It's four-way dodge rolling. You might not notice this if you haven't played Dark Souls 1 before, but the dodge rolls aren't omnidirectional or at least eight-way. No, they are from where you're facing forward, left, right, and backward. Nothing in between. This four-way cardinal direction bullshit also applies to plunge attack, which means if you need to fall slightly forward and the enemy is slightly left of where you would land, you literally can't hit it. So plunge attacks aren't ever useful unless you're standing right above the enemy. Watch the same boss fight clip again. Do you notice anything else wrong? There's a core mechanic in this game that arguably makes this game harder, and if you see somebody doing it, as an experienced Dark Souls player, you might be inclined to think they're new to the game, just because of how clunky it is. I'm talking about the lock-on function. Is he actually just dead? That was the easiest boss fight ever, I just had to not lock on to him. Like honestly, it's so bad that using the lock-on function is a sign of a noob, and it's just best 
to not use it except when wanting to parry? In general, the camera has such weird behavior at times that some people are inclined to call the camera the hardest enemy in Dark Souls. Speaking of the name Dark Souls, there are some areas that are legitimately designed with a philosophy of Fuck you, this game is called Dark Souls. Now good luck seeing anything, idiot. Blight Town is a big offender where you walk into the area that borders it and your screen literally gets a filter slapped onto it. See what I mean? Normal vision. I got vomited in my face. Normal vision, vomit. Normal vision, vomit. I hate it. But Blight Town isn't the only offender here. There is another area that basically blindfolds you before leading you into it, and in this case, the single possibility you have of seeing anything other than your three millimeter defeater is to grab one of the lanterns, which you can't just equip, but you have to actively wield and activate if you want to use it, and you can't attack while doing that. Yep, it's Tomb of the Giants. Oh, and have fun finding where the correct leaps of faith are that you have to take in order to get to the next area. You'll spend a couple hours here trying to figure the shit out. Bed of Chaos, Blight Town, She's Cursed. Do you know what all of these have in common? Exactly, they feel gimmicky and cheap. Seriously, Bed of Chaos was a boss designed so poorly that the devs put out an official apology. And not game mill template recycle type of apology, no, a real apology. This gimmicky and cheap feeling may even be extended to the final boss of the game, Gwyn. As soon as you find out that you should parry him, he just becomes a timing fest. Parry, R1, wait. Parry, R1, wait. Dodge once, walk up, parry. R1, wait. Rinse and repeat until he's fucking dead. This was easy, even for me, who didn't parry a single enemy in this game up until the very last boss. It took me five tries at most. Not gonna lie, as a final boss, kind of underwhelming. I was expecting a huge second phase or at least a cool fighting cinematic. Seven out of 10, not bad, but not amazing. I did love the iconic Blin, blin, blown in the background though. Do, 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 The gimmicks may be ugly, but perhaps most ugly of all, Dark Souls spawned a wave of elitists who separate all the people into two categories. Has beaten Dark Souls, and hasn't beaten Dark Souls, with absolutely no in-between. If you haven't beaten Dark Souls, you are not a real gamer to these people, the same way that you aren't a real music enjoyer to metalheads if you like listening to anything slightly popular. Okay, time to give a score. I know this game is more than a number. It's an entire genre, even a lifestyle, a philosophy for some. Alas. I must give it a number. And in today's world with no roast tint on my prescription glasses and no nostalgia for this game at all, I've just beaten it a week ago. Years after playing Dark Souls 3, I'd say this. I'd give it a 16 out of 20, 7 out of 10, a 2 out of 5, a 1 out of 2, and minus 1 out of 0, and a review on Metacritic that just says, The darkest souls are those who can't accept that it's valid to criticize something you enjoy. As far as being overrated, I frankly think it is. People tell me it's the best in the Dark Souls series, no questions asked, and I have to disagree. I think the developers learned a lot of valuable lessons along the way and ultimately made a better game called Dark Souls 3. But that's just my opinion, and no, it's not because I have nostalgia for Dark Souls 3 either. Ultimately, I enjoyed playing Dark Souls 1, but no, I wouldn't play it another 13 times about a thousand hours into doing challenge runs of it. But I think if you've agreed with some of the points I made in this review, I can speak for us and say, we all know that Dark Souls 1 isn't the end all be all of games. It's ultimately a testament, an avant-garde game design statement. This video is my review of Helldivers 2, arguably an avant-garde PvE co-op shooter that does many things right. If you don't want to watch that, you can still subscribe and await a new video or tell me about what I should review or talk about next in the comments. Have a good one, Mandy over and out.